We've been working on the last several months, and, and actually, we first started talking about this a couple of years ago, at least. Peter Wright, uh, if I can get to this, why is this not working? Uh, there we go, I've got it. Peter, are you here? Stand up for me for just a second, okay? Peter Wright. If Peter hadn't, hadn't approached the president about three years ago, we wouldn't be here today talking about this because he really came up with this, this idea. And early on, we talked about this would be a project to recognize the Miami and other indigenous tribes that were here before the university was here. Something that could educate students, alumni, <clears throat> visitors about the culture of the Miami tribe, past, present, and future. Celebrate the relationship of the tribe and the university, the partnership that we have. So, so how can we do those things? Well, first of all, I will be the first to admit that I didn't know a whole lot about the Miami tribe when I started the project. So I had a lot of research to do. You know, I knew a little bit, but probably about what the average uh, administrator, faculty person would know on campus. So we took some trips. We went up to Indiana, had a nice trip up there last fall, looked at some things, saw the seven pillars, fantastic. You see George in action there checking out something. I think he was looking for mushrooms. <laughs> We've got some information from Michael Ganella. I know Michael's here. He's sitting back there. Michael's joined us for several meetings. And Michael's uh, been very, very generous in providing to us his, uh, his dissertation about the native plants in the area. And we have that information now, and we're going to use that to incorporate that into this project as well. Um, we start looking at cultural symbols, uh, what we might do with cultural symbols. And I'll ask a couple of students to, to talk about a few of those things. <laughs> Nose goes. Um, so one of, the, uh, one of the principal things we wanted to incorporate in the design of the, um, the outdoor area, we wanted to incorporate um, some aspect of the lunar calendar because um, it, it's really how we measure uh, ecological changes over the course of a year as well as just the, um, the constellations themselves. And you can see in the, uh, like down on the bottom more section, the left shows um, Achika, our constellation, um, uh, in like the regular English constellation, you see it as the little dipper up in the northern sky. And as the year goes around, um, Achika is constantly chasing its tail around the northern star, Achika Alangwa. And then the lunar calendar um, with the phases of the moon. In fact, right now, and George, correct me if I'm wrong, we're in Andequa Kilswa. Um, the, uh, the lunar calendar is huge um, in measuring just the ecological changes over the course of the year um, and, and really un understanding you know, what, what is happening in the world around us um, as, the, as the year goes by. It's incredibly culturally important, so we wanted that to have a significant place in this, uh, in this outdoor area especially. Uh, we also touched on the different directional colors. We wanted to try to find a way to incorporate that in there. Um, so with uh, Miami Mia Direction, we have four directional colors, uh, red, uh, yellow, black, and blue, to each to symbolize different directions. So for east, we have Awan Sapanjishe. The word for east is the color yellow. It's the color of the rising sun. Pengish and Geshe for west, the, um, we have the color red for the, the color of the setting sun. Um, and for south, we have our Mayakwa Jishi, we have the color blue, uh, which um, for some people who may not know, when the sun is at high noon in the middle of the day, the sun is actually slightly more south than it is north. So that's why the south is represented by blue. And then the north um, uh, is Papuna Kiong Gishi. Um, is represented by the color black, which is also in reference to Papunwe um, or winter, um, associated with another ecological feature. And so we wanted to, you know, have some geographic orientation from a Miami, uh, from Miami perspective incorporated into this as well. We've also taken trips out to Miami, Oklahoma. I was fortunate enough to, to attend uh, both a summer and winter gathering. Uh, the summer gathering, we had some tornado uh, alerts, and so we spent the evening in the basement uh, uh, for a few hours, but that's, uh, that's all part of it. But it was great to, to see uh, some of the events that go on for those. So, so we started doing the, the background and the research. And the first thing on a project, really, you, you need to decide what you want to accomplish with the project. You know, why, why are you doing it? So we developed a design concept. 
And we start talking about a lot of the things we've been learning about. But basically, the first thing, of course, we want to tell the Miamia story, past and present. We want to think about origins and how might we incorporate that, the importance of family in the culture, earth and sky, arts and crafts, preservation, rebirth, partnerships, development, and looking forward as well. We want it to be a gathering place, formal and informal gathering place, a place for individual reflection, an outdoor classroom. We could actually have events there. A place for discovery as well, so you can find some things, maybe go there for one reason, just to maybe get away from everything from campus and, and find something you didn't know was there and so some sense of discovery. Obviously a place for teaching. It could even become a field laboratory, the plants we're talking about in the different seasons and what plants are, are coming up, what, what their uses are and so forth. Growing and even harvesting the plants. So we had an idea of the design concept and then we need to find a site. So we've got a pretty good sized campus and there were a number of things we thought about with that. We want it to be within the natural environment as much as possible. We want presence of water there. We, we, it was clear how important water is, both running water and uh, rivers and lakes. Uh, we want it to be beneficial to the campus. When we're working on these kinds of projects, I always try to find something that can be a win-win. It accomplishes what you want for the project, but it's an enhancement to the campus as well. Visible, we want it to be visible so people know it's there. We want it to be visitor friendly, you can get to it. Accessibility, pedestrian walkways are there. We want parking to be nearby. We want it to be ADA accessible. Proximity to academics. One of the things about there is uh, there could well be classes that could be held inside. We have a lot of winter weather here in Ohio, but then you could go outside to the side as well. So is it close to some place where we could have indoor classrooms? And then a potential for growth. So this could continue to evolve over time. And as more students come, more things can be added to this project year by year. So looking at the selection, went through a lot of things, thought about all those, and we ended up down there in the lower left-hand corner by the art museum of all places, and that's a good place. There are a lot of good things in the art museum, a lot of things to do with the Miamia tribe. We'll zoom in on that a little bit, a little bit closer. You can see that area there where there's a natural running water. The, the water naturally drains from uh, the campus west of that site under State Route 27, and there's a creek when, the, when the, it's not too dry that runs down there, and runs down to the pond. We're zooming in a little more, you can see it there. It gives you a good reference point. And, yeah, the art museum there, 27 going up to the north here, and we're talking about this area right in here. Some views of it. It's not the most beautiful site right now, but that's part of why it'll be beneficial to the campus because we're going to improve that and make it a better site. Visually, at least. It's, it's a good location already. I've turned 180 degrees there, so you can see some different directions on where it is. Here we're looking from the north, looking down to the south. A few more views. You can see how it drops down from 27 as well. So we want to be able to, to get some separation, a place where you can get down to a place of some uh, seclusion because we all know there is noise that comes along 27. They did a lot of work there in the last year or two and anyone that lives around here knows that very well, the construction on 27. So that changed the contour some and changed a little bit of our thinking on where some placement of things might be. Meetings, we've had a lot of meetings. And we have our meetings on Friday afternoons at 4 p.m. And the students actually show up for that. So you can see how dedicated they are to, to working on this project. And there we are over in Bonham House, and, and you can see us in action with some drawings, and, and we bring in new tracing sketches each week and talk about them. And uh, one of them is site analysis, one of the first things you do on a project, and Quinn is gonna talk about that. Right, so once we got the site and decided like where we on campus we wanted to be, um, we started to look at the site analysis and you can see the pink line going up top is the pedestrian walkway so then students will be able to walk by and see it and um, know it's there and maybe want to go explore it. And then the blue is the, um, the, like, the road there so cars driving by also get to see it. And then the parking is right there, right next to it in the bottom left. And then further, if it is like a weather problem, the, the auditorium is very nearby too. Um, and we looked just at the sun angles, noise, and wind, and took all that into account when it came to uh, designing the rest of the place. Thanks, Quinn. Quinn's an architecture major, so this fit right into part of her, uh, part of her work and studies. So the, the design concept kind of changed as we went from week to week, too. Kind of started prioritizing some of the things that we thought were really important to, to integrate into the design. The origins, certainly earth and sky. Preservation of language.
to assist with the preservation of language with this project? How can we talk about the rebirth and the partnerships and the partnership with the university? The gathering place was obvious, discovery learning, an outdoor classroom, we've talked about that, the proximity of the water, and a sense of place. And, that, and that's an important thing too, that um, things need to have an identity so that when you arrive someplace, you know you've arrived someplace. You know, it, it has a sense of that place, that there's something, something special here, and we've tried to do that. Uh, you can see the site there uh, with the flowing water. We've got the standing water, the pond there. That all plays right into it very well. And before we actually settled in the site, we looked at some other ponds that are around campus. You can see one fairly new there in the upper left at Presser Hall. That's part of our stormwater retention project, our master plan. So we're, we're looking much more on campus about how we can work with the environment and, and reuse our water. We're, and we're doing that with the ponds over with the new residence halls as well. And we're using that water actually to, to uh, water the play fields across 73 there at uh, Cook Field. We have Dogwood Grove Pond. We have the Western Pond, which is just to the east of our site. And those are all good, good locations. And, and the Western Pond was one of the reasons we thought of this location. But those all already have their own identity. You know, they are places on campus and people know them. They have their own characters and qualities. And we needed something that, that is unique to this project for us. So we wanted to be able to create our own pond. Came to that conclusion. So if we create our own pond, what do we do with it? And how can we use that as part of the tool? Well, the Great Lakes are play into the origin of the tribe, so maybe the first idea was, I said, why don't we make this the shape of the Great Lakes? That's an interesting idea. We can talk about the, the birthplace of the tribe there. And then I pulled up this map and looked and I said, that's gonna be a really strange shaped pond <laughs> to try to do that. Uh, I said, okay, how can we expand this a little bit? Uh, of course, the orange in there at St. Joe. Now, well, let's look at the, the watershed going into the Great Lakes. What's the shape of that? And there you can see the watershed. I said, okay, now, now we can start to work with something. So maybe we can integrate both, make this part of an education of the watershed that goes into the Great Lakes and show the Great Lakes as well, and the whole thing will become part of the pond. So that's a shape we can work with. So we took that shape, we liked that idea, we talked about that, went back to our site plan and started placing it on the site. We probably put it in 20 or 30 different places, push it closer to the road, further away from the road, north, south, in every which direction. Uh, we wanted the orientation to be accurate and, and the size, how big or small is it. And those are still some things that are in, in play here and, and part of the design. It, it's, it's very much a work in progress. What we're showing you today is a design concept. I think the location is correct. The, the composition on the site is correct. But the real details of the design of each one, they still need to be worked out and will be done over the next, next several months. So then we start expanding this across the site and start looking at how we might parts, put some of these elements. Where would the gathering place be? Where might we put some of the plants? Start working that through. And you can see that line down through there. I was working down through the valley coming up with that. And then just kind of casually in a meeting one day, that was a linear approach. I think Daryl said, well, that's, that's good, but let's don't place them chronologically like linear because we don't think of, of events in time like that. We think of it more in waves and, and like a pond, and you throw the stone in the pond, and there's a story about that, the education. So that was just a total shift for me. I was, I was linear thinking, and, and it's, it's uh, the wave theory. So that changed a lot about how we started looking about the placement of the elements around the site. And you can see we started thinking about that out from the, from the Great Lakes, the pond we're creating. Started looking at the contours on the site and how we can, can shape this to, to fit our needs a little bit better. Started looking at a gathering place on the hillside here overlooking the lakes. Started looking at a, some kind of a, a presentation place, an orientation or, or a, a, a presentation place down there. So we had the tiered hillside viewing the pond. And there's a really nice tree up here. It's getting some age on it. We're talking about planting another tree so that we can make sure that we have the continuation of that. But we really like the sight of that tree and how it overlooks this, this terraced area and down to the lake. So we said we'll call that the gathering tree. Okay, so a place to, to do that. We expanded that concept then to think about that and then including the gathering tree, not just for individuals, but for the gathering of, of a conference like this and the, and the partnership, the Miami tribe. And then we even expand that a little bit more a little later. So then from this, we're looking at the, the performance area and you look at the, at the line of sight. And I was thinking about the linear line of sight. Actually, as you approach the site and come to gathering tree and you look down over the hillside down to the pond. And so I started organizing those in a line and that was fine. You always think about the, the, the placement of these elements, how they relate to each other. Start looking at a cross section through the site and how the terraced hillside might start to work. And then I thought, okay, at the St. Joe, I went, 
I keep pushing the wrong button for the pointer. Uh, the St. Joe and the Origin is up here, and this is more about present day. If we want to celebrate and talk about the partnership and, and Oxford, and we think about that as Oxford. But well, if we do that, why don't we think about the stage area in the center being something different as well? And what if we think about that as, as the primary village in Kikionge? Okay, and we just start thinking about some sense of place of things like that. And then we look at the orientation and change those axes just a little bit. And why did I, why did I crook them just a little bit with a little bit of an angle like that? Because I got on, on Google Earth and looked at where those places are, and those are the, the angles. Okay, from St. Joseph, the mouth of the river, down to Kikiange, down to Oxford, Ohio. So we transpose those actually right on the site. So now we have some really reason for putting things where we're putting things. It's not just happenstance. And it's a pretty easy step from there then as well. If we start thinking that a little bit longer, we have those axes and we think about the tribe and its past and present. And Miami, Oklahoma is very much the present today. And we start looking at those angles and where are those in relation to Kikiange? Where are they in relation to Oxford, Miami University? So we transpose those onto the side as well. Now we're really starting to get a pattern. Okay, now we're really starting to get something we can place a lot of elements on the site. So you can stand in one place and if we have some kind of markers out there, it's a site, it's a, it's a signpost that from here over that marker a few hundred miles is Miami, Oklahoma. Okay? And that's why that particular piece of, of art or whatever is going to be there. Maybe we can do something between those two to give us something. Um, we start embellishing the gathering tree. How do we make the gathering tree itself feel like a place? And you get to that place and you know it. And we thought about, and this was Pete's idea, one of his ideas, about some tribute words that we could do as part of the fundraising. And I think Megan's going to talk about that. Sorry, I'm short. Um, so yeah, more about the gathering tree. It's basically the most significant part of our design that shows the relationship between Miami University and also Miami Tribe, because... Really? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, <laughs> got you. <laughs> um, but like beyond just having like Miami University, the name, um, they've also been kind enough to hold events like this and also the Miamia Center on campus, which is so helpful in language revitalization and all the work that they're doing there is really incredible. And also giving the students here an opportunity to have a class about um, the Miami tribe and our heritage and culture. And like Haley was talking about earlier about A1 Zapata helping grow the identity of the young kids there. It, the class that we take here is very important in growing our identity as Miamia tribe members. So we wanted to use the gathering tree as symbolic of that relationship that has been growing since the 1990s or like even as early as the 1970s. And then we also have the donor stones that you can buy, wink, wink. And yeah. Um, our design for the stones has gone through a lot of tweaking and it's not quite set in stone yet. No, they will be eventually. Yeah. Uh, Honey, oh. so, I'm sorry. Um, but originally they were just square stones. We'd put like um, the donor's name on it and then also we'd have bilingual phrases and not really set on the phrases yet either, but we'll get them down. I think we'll show later a few examples of what we're thinking of putting on there. Oh. Maybe we'll show them now. Right there, okay, yeah. Or if not. Yeah, and there are a few examples of the phrases that we'll put down and, you know, if you're a donor, you can choose which word or phrase you want and it'll have the English translation and also the Miamia, which is also symbolic of the coming together of the two separate entities. And, yeah. Can we talk about the gathering tree there? Since, oh. You know, yeah. oh, yeah. Um, Where is it? Yeah, the one kind of in the middle that has, like, kind of bare branches at the bottom. Um, it's an eastern red, red cedar, which is Xinguaqua. Xinguaqua. Yeah. Ish. Uh -huh. But right now, that is the tree that we're going with for the gathering tree. But um, it's a little later on in the years, so probably when we strike ground for the first time, we'll plant a new one, which is also symbolic of the birth of a new part of our relationship. So, yeah, it's all really cool. <laughs> You're kind of giving me an idea of what our committee meetings are like on Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock. <laughs> Some of the early studies that we started looking at are actually showing this on the site and how the organization starts to, to look visually. Uh, sometimes we can visualize that in our heads, sometimes not. Sometimes we need some assistance with that. 
the gathering tree, uh, the next piece, uh, creating a border of stones around the lake and the ponds. Uh, part, of the, part of the family and that idea of concept, we thought, let's, let's expand this, this whole thing. It's, it's not just the Miami tribe, the Miami tribe, but it's the Great Lakes tribe as well, other tribes or neighboring tribes and so forth. So let's make some kind of a border around that. We'll put the names in. When are you gonna talk about that a little bit? No one's taking that one? Okay, <laughs> that's fine. And, and this is an idea of how we might do that. Okay, so we've got the pond there on the right. We put some kind of a border around it to show you know, you're near the water as well. But then, then we've got a list of the names. We can add the tribe, tribal names there. And we, we really liked that idea. I thought that was coming together nicely. So what might we do with the sculptural ga gathering, uh, greeting, uh, the, sort of the signpost. If people are just driving up 27, coming to Oxford or through Oxford for some other reason, you know, they, they, they know the campus, but suddenly they're coming along and say, oh, what's that? That's something new. Uh, we, we, let's come back and we have some time and find out what that is. So we'd actually put the name there, uh, maybe some sculptural pieces to that. This is just an idea of what we might do using some Indiana limestone that we can put into some kind of a composition, maybe some relief of images onto that. It's still need to be worked on. We're talking with the, uh, the art department, actually a meeting this week to talk about a collaboration with art students next year, next fall and spring semester of actually designing and, and hopefully fabricating some of these pieces as, as projects to add to this. Uh, turn this around, talk about this a little bit. Okay, so you can see the organization. I flipped it 180 degrees on you. So the, ga the gathering tree is up here now. We see the axes down to the stage of the performance area, the terraced hillside, the ponds here, all that. And starting to show some of the, the stage area. What can we do with the stage area? If we want it to be Kikiongi, how do we make it that? You know, how do we, are we just gonna put a sign on there and say this is what it's supposed to be? We, we have some maps. And we thought we can integrate that into it. Why don't we want to talk about that, Zach? We talked about this one a lot. So um, another name, uh, or more like a nickname for Fort Wayne, Indiana, is the land of the three rivers, um, which is the St. Mary's, the St. Joseph's, and the Maumee. And so um, what we wanted to do was uh, find a way to commemorate the, the three sources of water that were uh, uh, like a big, like, cultural significance in that er in the area of Kikayonge at that time. So for during the stage, or for when we create the stage, um, there's going to be like little engravings potentially of where the rivers would be um, in a sense of like if Kikayonge was actually there. So you'll have your Tawawa Sepewe, your Namewa Sepewe, and your Kochisa Sepewe. Um, represented in the actual stage itself to give it that further sense of place of um, making it represent Kikai Honge more than just saying, okay, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> Another study rendering of how that might start to look from the terraced hillside looking on down beyond. Yeah. So at, once we came up with the idea for the amphitheater and having it overlooking the watershed, we wanted to still incorporate this, um, this idea of the lunar phases and the lunar calendar into the, the concept as a whole. So actually, is there a picture? Yeah, there we go. So um, when, you're, when, you're sitting, when you're standing down at the stage looking up at the, at the tiers of the amphitheater area, um, we, we drew in the phases of the moon as it continues along the arc. So it, it mimics in some way the path that the moon takes across the sky um, just through, throughout the night. And yeah, there we go. You can see them, uh, they're faded into the, into the upright um, edges of the tiers. But it, it mimics the, um, the moon as it travels through the sky, as it changes phase and as, it just, uh, as the night goes on. Um, so you can see it going from your waxing crescent all the way over to your waning. And then the idea was that at the, uh, at the very center, the way, if you follow the circle all the way around, the center of the stage is then the, the new moon, the full moon being at the very top. So another element had been added to the project at that point. Uh, which one are we on? The kiosk, the welcoming kiosk. We wanted something as you approach either uh, pedestrian from the campus as you're coming um, from, the, from the north part uh, where the pedestrian sidewalk is or from the art museum. And so on each end there, we will have something that's about this height, about 
a podium height that you could come up to, and it will tell you what, the, what this is about. What is this place? What is this you're approaching and you're, you're finding right now? So I have the name there. We'll give you some of a history of what the project has done. Uh, we'll have some cultural symbols around and so forth, but it also starts to help setting the boundary, doing more of that, creating that, that sense of place. You know you've come up to a kiosk, you have arrived at something, then you read it and you find out what that is that you've arrived at. So we, with these and with the signpost out here, then the natural fall back into this direction. You really, now you're really starting to get some defi definition, you know you're at a place. Here's another view of it, an aerial view, so you can see how things are starting to line up and how they fit into the side. And you can get an idea of the sense of scale. It's like it's really, got, you know, it has a nice size to it. I mean, it, you know, it's going to be the size of this auditorium, approximately. Uh, uh, if you look at the road from, from here, you should come down to the gathering tree, the kiosk up here, on down the hillside through the lake, and the kiosk on the other side of that as well. Ah, here one again. Here one again. Okay. So continuing with the theme of just the night sky and how we um, not only wanted to incorporate the lunar calendar in the face of the moon, but also um, the Meow Meow constellations, um, down uh, with, uh, with the site facing north as you're standing on the stage or sitting in the amphitheater, um, in the northern sky on the other side of the hill and trees, you would uh, have the opportunity, if it wasn't obstructed, to see uh, the constellation Achika making its way across the sky as the year progresses. Um, so we came up with the idea of just across the water feature, across the watershed in the, in the hillside on the other side, having lights that dot out the constellation itself, um, making it visible, representing it where it would be up in the sky. And so regardless of the weather, regardless of the time of year, you have the opportunity to see Achika making, making his trip around. We like the element of surprise and design too, so, and that's part of that discovery thing. So if you're there in the daytime, it may look like that. You may see some little fixtures of some kind out there in the, in the, uh, the growth that will be planted, but if you come back at night, it could look like that. And it's in the right orientation, you're looking up to the north sky as well. The next one we really talked about and, and really wrestled with this for a while, and that was how do, we, how do we recognize the removal and that part of the history of the tribe as well. Um, and we probably spent more time talking about this than any other of the design elements, and George is going to come up and talk about that. Sorry, I'm tall. <laughs> as, uh, as, as, as you saw earlier in, in Mike Donella's presentation, um, in our history as well as in our revitalization, we can't overlook the importance and the impact of removal. We talk about it in our class when we use the metaphor of a stone in the pond as a, as a boulder dropped into the pond. And the waves from that event still affect us to this day. At the same time, we're not defined by that event. Um, so it affects us to a dramatic degree, but it doesn't define our existence. And so how to incorporate that balance of its importance, its centrality um, to our experience and to educating visitors um, but to not make it the definitive, um, the definitive element in the site. And so this um, balance between subtlety and um, exploration and discovery, as Bob talks about, shows up here in the route, which mimics the uh, path beginning in, in Peru and then going up through Fort Wayne, um, following the uh, Wabash Erie Canal, and then down following the Miami Erie Canal to Cincinnati, and then um, following the course of the Ohio River um, to St. Louis and then the course of the uh, Missouri River to Kansas Landing and then the final two lines to Sugar Creek and then after the after the Civil War um, in 1873 the beginnings of the second forced removal to the northeast corner of Indian Territory what became Miami, Oklahoma <clears throat> and so um, the the way the concept design now works is that the, the trail would be somehow marked um, uh, subtly at first perhaps with a small crack um, running through the line of the, the tier, very subtle, um, and some type of maybe crushed uh, white stone leading people to markers um, that would be visible. Um, these markers currently are just kind of placeholders, um, but that each marker would mark a, a, a specific historical moment. Um, we have a series of letters written from the, from the, from the journey, and so each marker could, could date that letter and be connected um, through other materials to a historic event. Um, and so then the, the trail, the potentially like light crushed stone, would link those features together. Thanks, George. Uh, 
back and we'll talk about this further. And like uh, Cha Chainza noted that we wanted to make sure that each of those, we have like these markers that are gonna be present, um, but we don't wanna make them like, like a defining part of the presentation. And so this is an example of what these uh, markers could potentially look like. They're not necessarily going to look like this. And as uh, Robert uh, also mentioned earlier, we're gonna be working with the art department on campus to figure out uh, creative ways to interpret like these symbols and um, find unique ways to convey this image and whatnot to all the important um, aspects of the journey with our two final ending points in the far distance over here being uh, the, the ending in Kansas and the, the, the eventual ending in Oklahoma, uh, where we are today currently. Talk about the, uh, the crane looking back. That's a good one. <clears throat> so uh, one of the potential ideas we were uh, looking at was is having one of the, um, the ending markers being a crane and we would and the initial starting marker down where Peru would also be a crane and the crane that would eventually end up being out where uh, Miami would be would be uh, facing back like turning around looking towards the the crane in uh, Peru to uh, to symbolize the the connection that we still have with our culture and our past and um, present uh, looking back to what we've had, to looking and then looking to where we are today, and recognizing that we are still connected. Um, uh, distance doesn't mean anything, no matter what. We're still culture. We're still a family uh, through thick and thin, and uh, no matter what. That was Zach's idea too. So this really shows all the elements that we've talked about, and this is the organization we have in at this point in time, and, and what's the right balance? You know, do we have enough information in there? It, it, there's a lot, and there, it's a, a rich uh, opportunity of, of things to look, uh, sources of materials to include into this. But you don't want it to get too busy either. So uh, we think we have a, a real good mix, the right balance at this point in time. The next steps are to really start making each one of these much more defined as to how we, how we uh, uh, create them, what they look like, size of them, and so forth, and placement. So that's the site as it is today. We have a few more images, renderings, images of this to show you, and that, that will conclude our presentation. But that's the way it is now, and hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll have those things incorporated into it. Okay, so now you can see the gathering tree, the terrestrial side, you can see how everything fits. This area through here, we didn't really talk about that, but to continue and support the, the campus-wide stormwater management master plan, this pond will be a functional pond as well to, to, to gather that rainwater, so it comes down through here, but whatever we do and however we show the Great Lakes within this pond, it needs to be fairly clear water. Uh, so we, we were talking about creating a, a natural bog kind of system, so the water as it comes uh, from the other part of campus that comes down through here it can be filtered and come down into this area and we haven't really decided on how we do the outlet yet either and how it goes on down to the creek will we create some kind of a dam might there be some kind of an overlook we didn't really talk about our overlook today there's a lot of other things we didn't talk about today. but an overlook as well to look at this and how how we might do that here's another view from the other way looking back up to the terrace hill side the fire pit now, we wouldn't have it a fire pit all the time. I thought we'd have a, you know, a cover on it of some kind, and probably mechanically fastened. So for a real event, someone could come in and take it off and build the fire and have the fire and then put it back and work in a uh, conclusion of it. Maybe a footbridge, a small footbridge over the bog and the filtration system that comes down. You can see the, the constellation over there, the other kiosk further off the side. Go ahead, yeah. Along with the site and um we also have been referencing uh, Dr. Ganella's work throughout uh, this entire process as well, learning about the different plants that you would find in Myong Myonggay, the, the, the place of the Miami people. And so we want to try to incorporate that around the, the area of the pond as well. So it's more than just, you know, uh, it can be more functional. Um, I think we even tossed around the idea of having like uh, crops that you could harvest potentially as well. Um, so we could, um, practice more traditional harvesting techniques and getting more uh, traditional like plants in the area um, that aren't normally found on campus right now. I'll let 
the images speak for themselves a little bit here. That gives you an idea of the sense of the, again, the scale for the, for the kiosk markers that we're considering. And that's it. We ran a few minutes over, but not too much.